there has been rapid change in all of our lives. One thing I've discovered is that assessments and plans I made prior to the epidemic might need updating for the world as it is now. Our team has been working on a tool consistent with our framework to guide reflection on risks and plans with special focus on factors that have unique implications in this pandemic. So I'd like to walk you through this tool that we're working on and still developing, be interested in your feedback about it. The idea is to have a way of reflecting on what might need to be updated about assessments and plans in light of the changing context. Strengths. What might be some of the person's strengths that are particularly active at a time like this? Or maybe some that weren't coming out before, but they are now because things are different. Like if somebody really likes to read or enjoys time alone, well, that could be a strength that maybe you didn't highlight before, but now you do. Living alone has actually been documented as a risk factor for suicide for some time. We've seen it in a few different studies. We've never really emphasized it as one of those long-term risk factors, but boy, now it really comes up as quite obviously relevant. Are they at risk for serious illness with COVID? Do they have one of those risk factors that the CDC or other medical professionals have pointed to? That might increase anxiety. Under impulsivity and self-control, alcohol or substance abuse becomes even more important now, as well as decreased ability to tolerate anxiety and tendency to act impulsively. Someone may have difficulty just staying still or staying at home, which could put them at risk in a lot of different ways. With respect to past suicidal behavior, here we'd pay attention to where a previous attempt might have taken place. We don't usually emphasize the location of an attempt, but it is actually important. Did an attempt take place at home? Was a previous attempt while somebody else was around? The stressors and precipitants that are especially relevant right now might be obvious. You know, it's those basic needs. Is a person's job at risk? Food, shelter. Another really important one, and I would again go through every person that you work with and think about, is their current physical, emotional, or sexual abuse present in the home, or is there a risk of that? Anxiety or panic can get activated during these anxious times. So while we'll still pay attention to any of the symptoms or sufferings that we always do, this would be a particular set of symptoms to track and see how is it fluctuating. Our colleague, Dr. Paul Yip from Hong Kong, actually analyzed suicide notes during the SARS epidemic, and he found that fears about getting sick, as well as about getting other people sick, were one of the things that had driven some of those extra suicides. And finally, engagement and reliability. Remember that engagement means how well is the person able to access and stay connected with the services that we offer. It's not necessarily a negative reflection on them if they're not engaged. It just means that what we have to offer right now is not something they can engage with. So is the person engaged with the services that we're offering as we're offering them now? And reliability is how likely is this person to reliably tell us when they're really in trouble. After we've reflected on the factors that inform our assessment and reflected on how those might have changed in a changing context, we can think about the possible effects of physical distancing or epidemic on the plans that are in place. Physical distancing affects how people connect with providers and peers, and it can render plans not doable. Some people who were referred for suicide-specific treatments and interventions may have difficulty accessing that treatment right now, like group skills training. Often, we rely on technology to overcome some of these barriers. The epidemic has sped the adoption of video conferencing and telehealth, but there are people who don't have internet access, or access that is so slow that it's not effective for live interaction. Other people are just uncomfortable using technology, and being pushed to use a solution that doesn't work for them can be stressful in itself. Giving family and support people specific things they can do is an important step in extending care for someone at risk. So it's important to check how that can be possible 
if the method of contact has been restricted during the pandemic. In our framework, we respond to suicide risk and then extend care beyond the individual, beyond our facilities, and into the person's life and context. That was a good idea before, and it's essential now. We can think about the possible effects of physical distancing or epidemic on the plans that are in place. You can use these prompting questions at the bottom of the page to think about next steps. They're organized by two of the core tasks of suicide prevention in the safe side framework, respond and extend. When it comes to responding, we're thinking about what are the steps that we can take that will match with the concerns that have been identified in an assessment. You could think about the first step as being, what are the drivers here? What are the factors that we've identified, maybe these specially relevant factors, that can be addressed through treatment or many interventions? We can think about what foreseeable changes need to be planned for and what modifications to existing contingency and safety plans need to be made. That includes lethal means restriction, especially those means that you identified before as ones that are available at home, and maybe those especially that have been identified before by the person. What now is the level of observation and contact needed? That can really change in the telehealth setting. Can we have a bunch of briefer phone calls that are more often? Don't underestimate the power a call or text can have. It might feel like it's not as good as seeing each other in person, but some people might actually like it better. Even before all of this physical distancing, there were times when I would have liked my therapist to call me instead of having to drag myself into the medical center to see her. And always we can think about what are the referrals that can be made to address unmet needs. The range of referral options is certainly different now. So that needs to be reconsidered. Some additional steps you can take to extend your response into the person's life and network would include drawing on research about caring contacts. You may have heard us talk before about non-demand caring contacts. Caring contacts are an evidence-based practice of sending letters, emails, or texts to people after they've been discharged from a hospital. These are brief, but powerful, because they send a clear message that you care. With the person's permission, consider revisiting which family and friends can be engaged, and how best to do that. Some people might withdraw in stressful times, just stay in bed all day, or try not to be a burden to loved ones. That can increase isolation for people already at risk. So we're all trying to find creative ways to extend care and connection. You might need to have a frank discussion about whether a person who lives alone could shelter in place with other family. Or if there's someone in the family, especially if they're COVID negative, who can stay with the person for a period of time. Now, the risks and benefits and precautions of doing this should be discussed with a medical professional. But it can be a reasonable decision, as long as there's not a lot of back and forth. And finally, what are the crisis resources that are now available? There's been a proliferation of new hotlines and support lines, some of them that are specific to the COVID crisis. Are some of those applicable to the person that you're working with? So as we've started using this tool, it's helped sometimes prioritize conversations that need to take place, planning and discussion with our team, as well as discussion with the person at risk and their family. This is a 68-year-old man who has a, uh, a, a, a really sarcastic sense of humor, um, very courteous person um, who has struggled with depression nearly his whole life. Uh, he's been through a lot. He is um, in recovery from, uh, from alcoholism. He's been sober for, I think, more than 30 years. Uh, other strengths of his are that he takes his treatment pretty seriously. 
that's particularly important right now because it's easy to sort of fall through the cracks. But if he says he's going to do something, he does it. He misses a lot of appointments, but he always calls first. And there's usually a health or other kind of reason for missing them. With the advantages of telehealth, that's actually even less likely. So he might get more contact right now than usual. He lives alone, and isolation is a major issue for him. This is a really big concern for me because I know in other uh, epidemic situations, it's been isolated older adults who've had the greatest risk, and I can definitely see that for him here. So the fact that he lives alone, is very isolated from other people, that's a big deal here. He's also somebody who does have extra risk for a serious illness with COVID. Uh, he is a smoker. He has um, other kinds of health problems. Um, and I would think that this would be somebody who you would be really concerned about if he got the, if he got the virus. Uh, alcohol and substance use, as I said, he has been sober for um, at least 30 years. His I did have a previous suicide attempt that took place at home. So that's a worry. Uh, basic needs, his income is definitely in jeopardy. He really kind of lives on the edge as it is. Um, but he works in a, like a skilled nursing facility, like a nursing home. And uh, his hours have been cut. Um, and when he is there, it's extremely stressful. Uh, so his basic needs being met are definitely a concern. Uh, there's no abuse in the home. His depression, although it's really, really deep, is pretty stable. His engagement is high. His reliability is also high. He's always been somebody who would tell tell me when he has struggled. He doesn't kind of over-report. He, he uses our, our crisis lines in select moments really well. So that's kind of a plus. In addition, the access to telephone visits have been a real help to him. He doesn't have access to any video technologies, just uses a, a very uh, simple uh, kind of flip phone, but uh, he's able to make that connection and he's now having more contact with us than he even did before. Uh, we've identified as a foreseeable change the loss of his part-time job, uh, if that were to happen, and that could happen in this, in this environment. Uh, so that's still a really big issue. In fact, it might even be a more bigger issue uh, because we uh, because of how many people are losing their jobs right now. And, and one of the people who he does have contact with, as I said, very few social contacts. He has contact with me and also his case manager. Right now, the case management uh, program is not able to make visits, obviously, but they're also really overloaded, and he's going to get very little contact with his case manager right now, uh, so that's another loss. As I would think through, what are the next steps? How can I respond and extend his care? Uh, first of all, I need to have a, a good conversation with him about that key foreseeable change of losing his job. What would happen and how would we know about it? How could we support him if that did happen? This was a, sort of a theoretical uh, thought uh, when we originally made these plans, but in this environment, it becomes more likely. And so we need to kind of revisit that conversation and maybe make some new plans. The level of contact, we've increased his contact. Shorter, but more frequent contact has been so far really helpful. And so that's kind of a, uh, an update to his plan. There really aren't other friends or family members that we can draw on, but there are some other new crisis resources in our area. There are some COVID specific uh, helplines that have been put in place, both at a state level and also locally. So there are some additional places he can call uh, when he's having trouble. And he has used hotlines before. I might need to get him uh, the phone numbers there uh, so that he has additional places to reach out in addition to our team.